today on Ask This Old House. I'm headed to Wyoming to help a homeowner care for his prairie grass. This is very common here. People move here for the lower population and a wide open landscape, but they're unfamiliar with it and it can be very overwhelming to suddenly have to manage a piece of ground of this size. And in Future House, I'll look at a whole new style of solar panel that moves with the sun. And we'll look at some simple techniques to keep your house safe from wildfires. And to again, have some spacing there so the fire doesn't spread with such high intensity. The idea is to lower the intensity as the fire approaches the home. For projects around the house, HomeAdvisor helps find local pros to do the work. You can check ratings, read customer reviews, and book appointments with pros online at HomeAdvisor.com. HomeAdvisor is proud to support Ask This Old House. Hi, Wanda. Hi, Jen. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Welcome to Wyoming. Thank you. Let's go for a walk. Okay, let's check it out. So, Wanda, you've dedicated your entire life to study the ecology of this area. I have. I'm from Wyoming, and I have a master's degree in rangeland ecology. Look at this area. It's just open grasslands, no trees. Tell me a little bit about it. It is the big wide open. We have very few trees here. We are high, 6,000 feet. We have 14 inches of recip a year and lots of wind. It's just really hard to get trees started here. Mm -hmm. So the native landscape is primarily grasses. And then we have a few forbs and some shrubs intermingled in that. Well, I'm really looking forward to working with you because I just got an email from a homeowner who could really use your expertise. Hi, John. Howdy. Welcome to Cheyenne. Thank, thanks for having us. This Hi, is John. Wanda. Hi. She's an ecologist. And I brought her along because of the email you wrote us, you know, how to take care of all this, all this land that you now have. Yeah, my wife and I moved out here uh, about six years ago from California. Um, and uh, we were living in, you know, kind of typical cookie cutter, close together type house, little neighborhood. And uh, um, we decided we wanted a little bit of space uh, between us and the neighbors, so. So this is a lot more land to take care of. Yeah, it sits on about nine acres. Mm -hmm. All right, so how typical is a plot like this? This is very common here. People move here for the lower population and the wide open landscape, but they're unfamiliar with it and it can be very overwhelming to suddenly have to manage a piece of ground of this size. All right, so let's go start exploring what you have and maybe you could help us with some tips on how to take care of it. Sure. Okay, yeah, so over here's the northeast corner of the property. The uh, owners prior to us had horses in here and there's a big corral that took up about uh, half the width of the property here. And Wanda, what do you see here? I see things that are fairly typical of a horse property. This is alfalfa. It has the purple flower. It also has a toothed leaf. Um, this is not native, but it's a great plant. It's commonly found in horse hay. It roots very deeply and that captures nitrogen. So that is a bonus for your That's soil here. That's a bonus. Here. Okay. Over here we have sweet clover, super for pollinators. It also roots very deeply, and that is also a nitrogen capturing plant. Okay, so those are two positives for the area. What are negatives? Our negatives are right here. All of this is smooth brome. Okay. It's an invasive, and you can see it will choke out the native vegetation. I mean, it's pretty dominant in this whole it's area. It's already spreading. Mm -hmm. The other negative we have right here with the red leaf is this is cheat grass. It's also an invasive, can get fairly tall, and when it dries off, it's very flammable. So on windy days, one spark, this whole field could take off. One spark from anything, from a cigarette butt, from a dragging piece of equipment down the road, and it burns like crazy. Well, so what kind of things can we do to get rid of it? There are selective liquid herbicides that can be sprayed on this, but it's way too windy today. So after you spray, a couple weeks later, you could come and reintroduce the natives. And then I think ultimately, it's gonna be easier for you to take care of in the long run. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so let's go to this part of the property and see what's over here. Okay. So John, when property owners have a large lot like this, 
I usually recommend that they start with a small piece and something visible from the house. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, the slider there on the other side of that, that's our dining room and kitchen. You know, we spend a lot of time in there and, and uh, so we're constantly looking out of those windows. So those are your main focal points. And from a design perspective, the more you see something, the more you're going to take care of it. You're going to see its pro progression and follow it. Yeah, sure. So this area is a little bit different from the side yard. We have mainly native plants and no invasives. So we have some hairy golden aster here, some fringe sage, and a little bit of buffalo grass. So that's a good start for this area. That's a great start, but we do have a lot of bare ground or bald spots. So I think we should do a native seed mix of grasses and wildflowers, and we should just do this area back here. Well, how are we gonna go about seeding that? We have a machine for that. So homeowners can rent this seeder from our local conservation district. The conservation district is encouraging small acreage owners to reseed their areas to control our local weed problem. So it's fairly simple in its design. It drills a little uh, groove in the ground, the seed drops down in the groove, and then at the end of it, you have a chain that makes sure you have good soil seed contact. So when you make the grooves, it helps the seed deposit in that, and then you groom over the top so it doesn't blow away? Right, okay. because if you just spread it on the ground, it'll blow. Got it. OK, so what are we planting here? We're going to plant four grasses and three wildflowers. And here's a couple of what we're going to do. This is prairie June grass. It blooms in June. It's bright green, little bunch grass. This is western wheatgrass. This is a little bit later in the year. It has that bright blue leaf Love and the, this texture. Yeah, it's great. It's grooved on both sides, so it's really drought resistant. Mm -hmm. And it has kind of a fan-shaped panicle to it. And this is our warm season grass for late in the summer. This is blue grandma, and it's called the eyelash grass. That is really beautiful. So we don't get a lot of precipitation here, and it's very windy. But the precipitation we do get often comes with snow. So snow can blow one to two miles before it evaporates. So we're going to use snow fence to slow the wind and make the snow drop out. So it will spread it evenly over the area we just seeded, and we should have good germination next spring. So as it starts to melt, it's just going to go into the soil. Instead of blowing away. Okay. And that's free irrigation. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't love free? Yeah, who doesn't love free? Exactly. So the plastic snow fence won't last very long in the wind. So we're going to give it some structural support by attaching it to livestock panels. We're going to pound in T-posts and stand up livestock panels and wire those together. And then across that, we'll attach the snow fence. We've chosen to site this on your west property line. The prevailing winds are out of the northwest. We'll capture snow on both sides and it will spread it out over the whole area. It's almost like you're making a sand dune out of snow. It's the same principle. OK, so the snow fence is installed, and it's ready to capture snow this winter. And what it's going to do is blow through it and broadcast over all the seed that we just sliced into the soil. Come springtime, it's going to go into the soil, free irrigation, and it's going to help with the germination process. Awesome. I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be cool. I have one last piece of advice. Don't mow. Prairie grasses don't need to be mown. They'll only get to about 18 inches. You'll have plenty of color, plenty of texture. And if you mow, you'll be back to bare ground and back to weeds. So don't mow. Cool. Less mowing, less work. Sounds good to me. Excellent. Thanks for coming out to Wyoming. Appreciate your, all your help. Yeah, thanks for having thanks. us. Thank you. Over the past several years, California has experienced several large wildfires. And those have been reminders that these fires can be very damaging to our homes and also sometimes to entire communities. 
The good news is that over the past decade, there's also been a lot of scientific research that will help homeowners better understand how they can protect their houses. And that's what we want to talk about today with Dan Gorham. Dan, nice to see you. Thanks, Kevin. So you are a former firefighter, but you're also a research engineer at a nonprofit that studies this phenomenon. Um, with all of your research, what's the sort of big takeaway about how these fires interact with our homes? I think the biggest takeaway is to just realize that wildfires and wildland fires in general are a natural phenomenon. And it's not just in California where we see them. We see right. them across the continental United States, Alaska, across the world, really. And the other important thing to realize is while they are natural phenomena, them burning down homes doesn't necessarily have to happen. And, and the number one thing that I think people visualize as what causes a wildfire to burn down a home, the big wall of flames, isn't what typically happens. And there are things that a homeowner and property owners can do to make their building and homes wildfire resistant. So if it's not the wall of flames that's burning down most of the homes, what is burning down most of the homes? It's a lot of the secondary ignitions. And what we think of those as the embers and firebrands that travel ahead of the fire front, the small little things that you might see coming off of a campfire, but mm. can be quite large coming off of a wildfire can get caught in combustible materials or on combustible sidings of your home and cause that to ignite. Okay, so if we're talking about things like embers in the air, I presume you guys are worried about materials and probably in particular the roof is a big vulnerability if we're talking about flying embers? The roof is always a big one. It's a big horizontal surface that's great for capturing embers and our number one recommendation is to use a non-combustible roof material. Mm -hmm. There is a standard test method that evaluates different roofing materials for its resistance to wildfire fire exposures, class A, B, and C, where class A is the best and class C is the least resistant. And here we have a typical asphalt shingle that is a class A roof assembly. And you know it's class A because it says so right here on the packaging. And what does class A get us generally? Class A in the test method gives you, for the largest fire exposure that the method has, a two-hour resistance to the fire. And is most asphalt a class A rated roof material? Most asphalt is. but other roof materials like wood shingles or metal yeah. roofing or tile, um, those also have to pass the same standard, standard test method, um, but they may not be class A. They may be class B mm. or class C. You know, it's pretty remarkable to think of a big ember that has fallen out of the sky in a wildfire, that it can land on an asphalt roof and burn for two hours without penetrating the house. Yeah, the problem typically isn't just the ember itself, it's when the ember lands into a susceptible fuel. So if we have debris like these leaves or pine needles that might accumulate either in the gutter or here in this crevice, the ember ignites that and that's when you get the fire that creates a problem. So that says something about maintenance as well, right? I mean, you could have a class A roof, but if it's covered in effectively kindling, you got a problem. Keep it clear, let the roof do its job. Maintenance is always important. All right. In terms of the side of the house, sidewalls, siding, you guys think about that? Again, we typically want a non-combustible siding material. Uh, common siding materials like wood siding, wood plank or shingles, vinyl siding, those are all nominally combustible. And the problem there is if you get a fire or embers that accumulate at the bottom, the fire can spread right up and can easily ignite the home. So non-combustibles would be the bricks, the stuccos, block. Around here though, we've got a lot of shingles and clapboards. What are we doing about those? So there are alternatives on the market and we have some samples right here. This is a fiber cement board. So it's non-combustible, but the finishing on it makes it look like a wood plank. So you get the best of both worlds. Okay. So that's great if you're building new. Um, I don't know if I want to take all my wooden clapboards off and replace it with fiber cement. That's a big project and a lot of cost for people to pull off clapboards and put on fiber cement. It is. It is. And so our number one recommendation is if you can't replace the whole siding that's combustible, replace the most vulnerable area. And that would be the lower six inches. So if you oh, have a combustible siding, you can maybe remove the lower six inches where embers would accumulate and might cause ignition of the home, you can remove those and replace it with something non-combustible. And that can be an alternative to replacing the whole siding. Mm, that's a good idea. Uh, in terms of the perimeter of the house, I'm thinking now bushes and shrubs and such like that. You guys thoughts on those? A lot. Uh, and th that is an important thing to, again, maintain for the home. And so we break the defensible space up into three zones. We have the zero to five foot zone, which should be non-combustible materials. Typically, you might be wood mulch, so you see like right here. But the problem with this is emery gets caught in here. It's basically kindling. This is going to catch fire and cause a direct flame contact to the side of your home. It is sort of like kindling. I never thought about it that way before. So I presume you guys prefer something like stone? Yeah, this rock mulch you see right here, which again is pretty aesthetically pleasing, but 
ember gets caught in here, you're not going to have a fire problem. No mulch, but also no bushes in that first five feet? That first five feet should have no combustible materials. Then you get five to 30 feet out from the home, and that's where you want to have some ornamental vegetation. You want to have a trees. We're not asking people to clear cut their whole property. Um, but when you space those, you want to have them such that the fire won't jump from one to the other. So you want adequate spacing between those. And then as I step out beyond 30 feet, do you guys care about out there? Are you thinking about that, or can I do whatever I want? So we talked about the wall of flames that typically isn't what causes a home to burn, but if you have big, tall trees that are really closely packed, you might have that scenario. So our recommendation is, is to trim those up so the fire can't get up into the crowns and to, again, have some spacing there so the fire doesn't spread with such high intensity. The idea is to lower the intensity as the fire approaches. Got it. Well, we appreciate the research you guys are doing and that you're sharing it with us, so thank you, Dan. Thanks, Kevin. Lots of houses are adding solar panels, and with good reason. Once you've paid for the equipment, you're basically getting free energy anytime the sun is shining. The panels convert the sun's energy into electricity. The more sun the panels get, the more power they'll create. Simple, right? But the roof can be a limiting place. There are obstructions to work around, like chimneys, skylights, and plumbing stacks. There are roof lines that get interrupted by dormers. And if your roof isn't facing exactly where the sun is pointing, you lose a lot of potential electricity production. I found somebody who has a way to make solar production even more efficient without putting a single panel on a roof. Hey Jim, nice to meet you. Hi Ross, how are you? I'm doing good. So you've been in the renewable energy industry a long time. Tell me about your background. Well, for the last 40 years, I've developed a range of renewable energy projects, including biomass, wind energy, and we've done a lot of ground-mounted and rooftop solar projects as well. Well, I've seen a lot of solar, but this one's unique. Tell me about it. This system was actually inspired by a sunflower. A sunflower in the morning opens its petals, points it to the sun, and follows the sun all day long. Yeah, I can see the resemblance. Well, this actually has a dual access tracking system in there, and that's biomimicry. We're inspired by nature. Gotcha. So what it does is it actually has motors that moves the panels and follows the sun all day long, and the second motor adjusts it so that the panels are at the optimal 90 degree angle to the sun. Right, so your system's tracking the sun from east to west, but also up and down as the sun's path changes through the seasons. And the advantage of that, I'm sure, is that you can get maximum power production out of your system. That's right, and in fact, this system produces 40% more energy than a fixed array solar panel. Wow, that's, that's impressive. Can I see one installed? Absolutely. This homeowner has had this system installed by the barn for about a year, and we're installing a new one by the house. Okay, let's go check it out. So Ross, as you can see, we've dug this trench. The house is over there with the electric service panel. Okay. And the system will be located right over here. Got it. All right, I can see the three conduits that terminate from the trench. Like with yep. any solar installation, we've got our 240 volt hot leads, the red and the black. We've got our neutral and we've got our ground. I like that. This conduit carries a Cat5 communications cable for data acquisition and remote monitoring of the system. There's a third the, conduit? The third conduit is a spare conduit. The homeowner is putting in a future installation. Got it. What you're looking at here are three earth screws already penetrated into the ground. This fourth helical earth screw will be drilled into the ground and this will be the foundation of the system, eliminating the need for a concrete pad. Yeah, there it goes. Look at that. You can see it's getting a little tougher at the bottom, so obviously we're getting down below the topsoil. Yep. Now we're ready to install the system on its foundation. So this flatbed truck is delivering the system. It comes fully assembled inside that crate. We'll use the crane to lift the unit up and place it on the ground. And then from the loader, we'll move it to the installation site.
So now Manny is feeding the wires from the conduit into the control cabinet and making the final connections. So Manny's programmed in the time, the date, the longitude and latitude, mm -hmm. so the panels know where the sun is and it can follow it. Now where he's powering on the system, and you can see the panels opening up and moving across the sky. Look at that. Wow, pretty cool. Jim, it is great to see both systems up and running. When we got it this morning, the first system that was installed was facing east, you know, to this direction. Now it's facing almost 180 degrees the opposite direction toward the barn. That's what dual access solar energy tracking is all about. Following the sun from sunup to sundown to create maximum renewable energy production. One of the questions I do have to ask is, what does it cost? The system fully installed ranges around $30,000, but it depends on site-specific installation criteria. Okay, and it's rated at? It's rated at two and a half kilowatt hours, but because of the intelligent features, the dual access tracking, the fact that it cleans itself, and the natural cooling ventilation, it's equivalent to a five kilowatt rooftop system. So it's pretty much at market rate. It is, and it also qualifies for a 30% federal investment tax credit, and many states around the country have state incentives for solar energy as well. And not to mention the local incentives too. Absolutely. But this is grid tied, right? It is grid tied, so that means that if the homeowner is producing more electricity than he consumes, that additional energy will go off to the grid, providing a credit for the homeowner. Right, and there are other options as well. There are other options. We have energy storage through a battery that's built right into the base of the system. So that same unit you saw would come in plug and play, allowing the homeowner to have battery storage. So that's great for off-grid applications or where you can't connect to the grid? Correct. Well, Jim, thank you very much for the tour. It's great to see the evolution of solar technology continuing to advance. So, Ross, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. I got to hand it to you, Ross. You're bringing some good <laughs> ideas, and that thing is cool looking. Although I'm thinking, for my house, if I'm going to put solar, I'm probably still just going to put it on the roof, right? I mean, yeah. this is pretty cutting edge. I'm still all for solar on the roof. There's no doubt. If you get the right roof for it. That's where solar should go. Right. But if you don't have the right roof for it, this gives you another avenue. Right. right? The fact that you can get more energy per square foot yeah. out of that system because it's dual axis tracking versus a fixed mount, there's something to be said about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's working like a much larger fixed system, right? It's sort of sure. punching above its weight class, which is great. That's right. That's right. Although, again, you know, maybe I love the look, but if I put it in my little backyard, my neighbors might not like the look either. Is it really yeah. residential friendly? Yeah, so I mean, it might fit in a residential setting, you know, in a small backyard, but might not. And so, but I think the bigger market opportunity is gonna be in commercial. Mm. So college campuses, office parks, uh, walking paths, right. things like that, I think that's the bigger opportunity for them. Yeah. All right. Well, it also makes you think differently. So thanks for bringing it to us. No problem. All right. And thanks for joining us. If you've got questions, we'd love to hear from you. So until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Ross Trithui for Ask This Old House. So you're going to get us on fire? Thanks for watching. This Old House has got a video for just about every home improvement project. So be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.